Okay, all right. Hello and welcome back to the Make Lemonade podcast, the show brought to you by Lemon Squeezy as we hope to inspire you to earn money from your own lemonade stand. I'm one of your co-hosts, James, and I'm back here with JR Farr, who's the co-founder and CEO of Lemon Squeezy. We're back with the first recording of 2024, so we thought we'd take a look back on 2023, some of the key moments for Lemon Squeezy and the team, and then we'll round off looking at what's coming up this year. Let's get into it. So JR, back with the first recording. Have you had a good break? Did you get up to much? Yeah, you know what? I I usually struggled like last year I I didn't I took Christmas and New Year's off and so I I was able to find myself getting away like I I forced myself to shut the laptop off and I I, I did read I I read books I I played some video games I hung out with friends I I I just I played my hockey thing that I do every year I I found a way to get away and I think that that's it's just needed man I just the perspective the reset the recharge the we all need it. And so, what? and I think a lot of the team was able to do that too, which made me happy. Yeah. So. A hundred percent. I've struggled with this for the last couple of years, actually taking full time off to reset. We were just chatting that I, I didn't, I managed to take time away from work, but I didn't feel as refreshed as I should feel. So it's like my priority in the next couple of weeks, maybe months that I'm going to get a week away where I'm not working. I'm completely going to recharge because I feel I need that to be able to operate the level that I want to. So it's good that you managed to get that in your break. I love that you did the hockey thing. I saw that on your Twitter. It tell, tell people what you do. This is so good. Yeah. So every, so I've played hockey now for almost 30 years. Holy cow. And I have a big group of friends here where I live. Yeah. So every year I just, I go and rent private ice for the for all my friends and we just we show up and have some beers and skate around and have a good time and like it's just it's the hockey's the thing where you you can't have your phone out there like you just completely escape from everything and it's just great i think it's cool like and i love that it brings all together even if i don't see them for the whole year it's like i see them again and it's like nothing changed and i it's just it's just great i think it's great it's so cool you do that. I, I'm more and more I'm realizing how important doing stuff outside of work is with your friends that is completely away from work pressures and also social media, phone technology. It's quite nice because I work alone mostly. I've got my friend, a community of friends in London that are also founders. We met up and did a, a Christmas do, like a local arcade thing. That was great. Nice. Um, probably football would be the equivalent for me of like the team thing where everyone gets together it's, it's the same thing and i think it it keeps me young i like to stay active and and you know fitness is a big part of my life so it's like i i, I think it's that that sport is is extremely challenging and it, you know you got to be mm-hmm. you know up to shape to play that game anyway reflecting back on 2023 jr you did a fantastic blog post on this and you said you spent far too much time on it but i love that you did it i love that you took the time to reflect on everything but i just wanted to go over some of the things that you wrote about we started off the year we're actually the end of last year which is why you didn't really get much of a break last year with of course the great gumroad migration how does it feel looking back on it a year later jr yeah that was a wild ride i mean i think that there's still a lot of people using gumroad which is good. Yeah. I think it's good to have competition. You know, lately, <laughs> this week, it's it's weird timing because <laughs> we've been talking about it and then they've started to comment on our Twitter feed. And I have no, I'm not, if you know me, you know that I don't, I don't like to bash competitors. I've, I don't think I've ever, no. I'm not bashing them. I'm just saying there was a lot of people that came to us because of the decision they made. It's not something we did, but so, and I think it's good that people still find that the place that they want to sell because I, I just think competition is good. It breeds innovation. It keeps people, you know, on their toes. And I, looking back, I would have hired a lot faster with support. That is probably my number one regret. I didn't, because ex- I just didn't expect the fire hydrant and I didn't, I just, it just never really slowed down. But it, you know, it, it did a lot of things like forcing us to do things, forcing us to refactor code or fix in infrastructure or yeah, just invest in the, like, some of those boring things that, you know, you yeah. have to take care of as you scale. And so, you know, like we said, when they responded to us, just thanks for the customers. But yeah, I've, I, it's interesting. Do you feel like you've had to do anything to maintain momentum or has it just sort of happened? Because I remember this time last year, 
I sold a bunch of wallets and I was like, right, I don't want to lose this momentum, but I completely lost it. Just I didn't do anything to capitalize uh, because I had other things on. It's worked out fine in the end. But for you, you, you might say that you didn't have to do anything to capitalize on that momentum, but I feel you have. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, well, look, we live in a world where it's like, you know, tension spans are pretty small. Signal versus noise is, you know, pretty outweighed in terms of like the amount of stuff you see online. So yeah, I mean, I think we had to really, no, we, we kept our nose to the grindstone, I guess. Like we really, you know, we kept shifting features. And I think that's something I can get into 2024 is if you think about our business because of the, the product, I'm a product based CEO. Orman's very product design oriented. G is very, we are a very product led growth organization, which isn't a bad yeah. thing. But that's how we've been able to capture, I think, in my opinion, that's been successful for us is we've created this halo around the brand of who we are and what we, what we kind of stand for. And then we've executed consistently with product-led growth and shipping new features. And a lot of those were led by people saying, I will move over in t- once this is ready, right? So we just, mm. a lot of that wash, rinse, repeat, what do you guys want? What do you, you know, vote here, vote here, vote here. Lots of votes. And that's really helped us lead this product-led growth. What happens though is that I've been reflecting on that I, you know, do I regret is that was a go to market strategy that we intentionally chose go to market with product led features to this audience, right? And it was, it was kind of split between the digital creator and the developers, right? That were looking to integrate these kind of type of platforms. That's what we chose and, and it paid off and I think it's working. And I think we continue to do that. And that is part of our DNA. But on the flip side, sales led growth, no marketing, Mm -hmm. right? Like we, but it's good because we, we, you know, as we can hire and get these heads of people that I'm talking about, heads of marketing, heads of sales, heads of growth, whatever. I'm excited to see what new, you know, fishing holes, I guess we go into, right? Yeah. Uh, I I like that you've taken the product uh, led growth approach because thinking back to roles I've had when I'm selling products and I'm sure you've seen this in organizations you've worked with in the past when you go with the sales first approach you're often just trying to sell things that aren't quite ready to be sold or you're trying to hype them up jack up the value of it despite the value not being there and the benefit of you doing it the way you have done it is you don't have to try and oversell something that doesn't already exist do you think there's any one feature that has been the biggest sticking point that when you released it helped more people be more confident or move over to the platform it's hard to say because if i look back at like month over month growth there were some months like i would say affiliates was probably the most impactful yeah. for sure uh customer portal was big usage based billing was a big big feature i don't know how impactful that has been yet so i would say affiliates was was definitely the biggest I mean, and, and, and where it's grown to with the 6,000 global affiliates, I, you know, like I keep saying that, but it's like, just, you have to stop and like realize what that actually means. You know, you got 1200 affiliate programs getting pushed by these affiliates. And I think that that's something that we'll, we'll, we've already talked about in 2024 is going back to get releasing V2 of affiliates, V2 of email, like taking those mm. two features to the next level. I'm really excited to see what that does. So, yeah. And the uh, final thing I'll say on the Great Gun Migration, the capitalization is you guys went ham on Twitter. You were lapping up every single person that had something to say on Twitter about Gumroad raising their prices. All the founders, many members of the team, you were just on it. And even you, JR, you put out your tweet and you put even money behind your tweets to help them get seen by more people. You were just, we have this opportunity, let's capitalize. And I feel was it, Twitter was the biggest driver of growth for you, would you say? Yeah, and I, there's two thoughts. So one is, you know, everybody in life, where, whatever you're doing, you're going to get it. There's going to be an opportunity that comes and it's just how prepared are you for that to, to capture yeah. it, right? And I think that we, we had a lot of things in place for a year and a half of building, right? Maybe even two years of kind of building and getting ready for that moment. I called it like a little bit of a coming out party with that audience. It, it wasn't like something that we, you know, it just, it kind of fell on our lap and we, we executed. And I, I, here's the other thing I want to say. I think there's something to be said for being obsessed or focused, whatever that word is that you want to use, 
And that's where I'm going in with 2024. Every time that I have chosen to stay focused, right? So we had this idea of make mm. lemonade, this big portfolio of bets and products. Yeah. <laughs> we went all in on lemon squeezy. That clearly worked. We chose product-led growth instead of trying to do sales and market. We chose that. We chose this audience. Instead of trying to do all these things, we chose the audience. Then you think about the way that we could have done YouTube. We could have done, I don't know, TikTok or LinkedIn. You know, that's where the SaaS business are. We chose Twitter, right? So like that allowed us as a team, everybody on the organization understood that Twitter was where we are playing. So, so you see what I'm saying? There's like a theme to that. And it's very intentional because of the obsession that we have in these different things. And I think if you're listening to this, if you're a founder, if you're a business owner, if you're trying to create something, I think we live in a world where it's really hard to say no to yeah. things. And if you really believe in what you're doing and if you can just get focused, taking 12 months, it's January 4th as I'm recording this, Take the next 12 months and get obsessed or focused on something and watch what happens. And so talking about the Series A, this was obviously a big moment for you as well. We spoke about this on our first episode back. I'll leave a link in the show notes. You say you like you maybe regret spending the time on it. I don't think you regret like going through the process, but how would you have done it differently? Well, I guess I should I shouldn't say that. I don't regret it. I think it was good. You know, probably could have time box it a little tighter. Mm. Kind of it kind of bled out where, you know, kept kind of chatting with some people and it just I probably should have just been like, We're done. Like we are not the, the round is closed. And I finally did that, but it just took me a little bit longer. But I don't regret it because it allowed us to like I mentioned in the blog post, we were able to think about our business. What mm. are we? Who do we stand for? Who are we going after? How are we packaging this business up? And then getting the financials and the business metrics all dialed in, I think was really, really helpful. So. Do you have a plan when you might revisit funding? Because you said this is something that means you can leave the door open for future. Yeah. And I'm there's no doubt you've had other messages and questions from people since that. So is it for you just focus on bootstrapping for now and just sort of, maybe revisit it at a time or just wait for another opportunity to come up or hit a certain revenue milestone? My approach has been, I'm still just happy to chat with people. I like, I talked to yeah. four, I talked to four private equity and VC firms yesterday, mm -hmm. just via email, just checking in. Yeah. They usually send me an email. How's it going? Can we get on call? I say no. And then we, here's my update and ping me in a few months. So and it's not mean, it's just I don't want to get on the phone and explain anything because I don't want to waste any time. I think we have a very specific goal for us as a company to this year. And I just want to stay focused and obsessed on that this year. So I don't think there will be anything. There's just no thoughts about it right now. It's great. I love it. Appreciate it. Obviously, if anything were to change, it's remotely crazy, but we're profitable. We have cash flow. Yeah, so why take it? So, JL, we touched upon some of the new features you've launched. You mentioned the affiliate platform's huge. You've also did the usage-based billing, which sounds, sorry to say, incredibly boring, but is, <laughs> but also sounds quite complicated and useful for those that really need it. Was that like a pain? Like people coming to you going, I need this metered billing because yeah. I don't even know what it means. Usage-based billing is just like consumption billing. It's like... As I use more of this credits, think credits or, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And, and, you know, it just, it actually just landed us a, a pretty big merchant that we're really excited about. It's, it's affiliate.com. Like what a domain, by the way. But that actually, that there was a, there's something we we're changing right now to our feature to allow like decimal anyway. So, so there, yeah. So that was, it's, it's been a feature that is more advanced, but that is also like, our intention of like, you know, maybe serving some of more of that upstream, like more advanced type of SaaS business that mm -hmm. needs that type of functionality. So it's, it was a big deal for us. And you also launched your customer portal, which I, I, I mean, kind of essential, right? But you did it beautifully. Um, it's so, it's so nice. I love that feature. Yeah. I think this sums up the way Lemon Squeezy approaches product. Mm -hmm. like you could have quite easily just made it boring, but functional, but you made it pretty pretty as well 
functional, pretty, extra features, invested time and effort into doing it with your bloody small team. And you also mentioned about investing in the developer experience, right? You got the Lavrel package, the Framer component, uh, the Next.js demo app, JavaScript SDK. Why did you invest so much in the developer experience? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what I was saying about that was our go-to-market kind of strategy, which sounds so fancy. But I just, that was what we wanted to focus on. We feel like that is where a lot of the decisions are made. So making sure that our docs, our APIs, our integrations are up to par and modern and and making it easy peasy to integrate. And so we have low code tools for people that are digital creators and we also have really advanced stuff. And I think that, you know, a lot of times people can start small and use the no code and then they want to take it to the next level and hire a developer because now it's, and I, so yeah, it's, I just think it's the way, I think it's the right way to be done. If you're going to build a platform like lemon squeeze, I think it's the way you should, you should think about it. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. Uh, I looked at your Twitter to see what the most popular feature was by Twitter likes alone. Joe, what do you think the most popular feature was that you launched purely from Twitter likes? Affiliates? No. What was it? There's between two, and they're two very Check different out, customized features. checkouts. Customer portal number one, ding ding ding, you got that one. What was number two? <laughs> oh, I said custom. I was saying customize, like we did that customization work around checkouts, emails, portals. Maybe that's not it. Shareable MRR charts. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's amazing because even when I did the post, I said, if you're not sharing MMR charts, what are you even doing? <laughs> it, I, I, you know what? When I, when I first switched from God Roads to Lemon Squeezy, I was like, th- this is one thing I really like about it. was like part of my decision making process of using Gumroad in the first place. This was uh, two, two and a half years ago. And I was like, People really like the Gumroad screenshots. Whenever I shared the graph, people liked it. And it was coming up more and more on Twitter. You're starting to see it switch now. You're starting to see it switch to, instead of seeing the Gumroad ones, you're seeing the lemon squeezy graphs that people are sharing. And by you making it easy to share, yeah, I think it's just, was that a difficult feature to build? No, no. Did it seem silly doing it? No, 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 no. It was intentional. We knew what we were doing when we were doing it. So, yeah. You know, Riverside used to do this with at the end of calls where they would take a screenshot and they they stopped doing it. Yeah. I thought I I always used to share and I used to share it loads. I did too. Um, I remember I've done that. I've done that in the past on my Twitter as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they've just stopped doing it. So making things easy to share that's branded, pretty, is, is very cool. You know, it's funny, like Twitter, speaking of Twitter and just sharing and talking and us being in in and out of conversations. And I saw one funny the other day where someone had posted about like tax and want to use this or that. And there was just (laughs) a ton of people saying, use lemon squeezy, use lemon squeezy. And it wasn't even us saying it. And then someone's like, man, I'm getting tired of these sponsored tweets by lemon squeezy. And this guy was like, (laughs) this guy that wrote the tweet was like, Dude, I have 300 followers. Do you think Lemon Squeezy paid me to do this? No, I just was complaining and and it was just hilarious like but yeah, we've we've been really fortunate to like just kind of see the the payoff there. And we just I've always have this thing where like I will I will never be complacent. I don't know if it's growing up poor or something, but I will never let my foot off mm. the gas. I will never all right, so the, the final thing I'll ask you before I ask you some general questions about the year. Uh, we obviously relaunched the podcast. Joe, thoughts on bringing the pod back? You've been happy with how it's gone so far? Yeah, I love it. We talked, yeah, here's the thing. We have talked a few times, like, why are you doing this? And I yeah. think it's been hard to, like, put a value on it because, you know, we talk about those intangible things, but, mm. you know, we have, like, the Versal CEO coming on as a guest. That's amazing. You get a lot of interactions like that. There's also been I heard I now that I've listened to you, I I really want to try Lemon Squeezy. I think that it's also helped me as a CEO bring on people like Jason Cohen from WP Engine, Rob Whaling. I, I don't want to forget like all these amazing guests, but just the way that they think and hearing their perspective, you know, gets the wheels spinning and the wheels turning. So like selfishly, I'm learning 
or, or gaining a new perspective to help me push my business forward. And then obviously, you know, I am excited to see the downloads and the YouTube channel has been, been pretty good. Like, I think the views are, are decent we're almost, you know, it'll be interesting to see how fast we can get to a thousand YouTube subscribers and then, you know, watching each one of the episodes pick up views as it drops. But if we can just do the whole 2024 obsessive focused on YouTube, I want to see what, what this can do. You're so right. Yeah, I've seen countless clients uh, that I've worked with on producing their podcast, ones that I'm not co-hosting on, uh, have just gr grinded it for years and then it just pops off and then the amount of benefit they get for having this medium for them whether it be on YouTube, whether it be the audio only, because the depth and the resonance of the connection that uh, listeners have to you when they listen, it's off the charts compared to almost every other medium because they're listening for an hour in many cases. Yeah, and you know what else too that comes to mind is like, I've obviously built a lot of companies, had acquisitions, and I've always had a little bit of like, I lead a lot with humility and almost like this imposter syndrome where like I'm not as good as anybody else. And but then I see all these guys with like a ton of Twitter followers and it's like, you're not even that good. You just are, you've just been <laughs> consistent and you've, yeah, it's like, I don't mean that rude, but it's like, you haven't even really been that accomplished. You just talk a lot on here and you, you manipulate the, the algorithm. And it's like, that's what I'm saying in 2024 is I want to get louder myself as a CEO and YouTube, Twitter, just get myself out there more with my content and get people to, I don't know, just have maybe a no bullshit CEO come in and be like, hey, I, I like the way he does things. Like this is motivating or this is, I'd like to think that maybe I could help inspire people in a different way. And that's what gets me excited too about this year with the podcast and trying to push that more. And it's not like a selfish thing. It's just more I think it helps the brand. Like, look at Orman. He's got 75,000 followers on Twitter, and he's he really mm -hmm. brings in a design audience. And I think that there's something to be said from the business perspective and minds that, how do you do this? How do I do that? And it's like, it's really cool just to think after the rest of this year, oh, go watch that episode. This is, we broke all that down over here, you know? So we've done hiring, we've done churn, like, and maybe we can kind of rehash those again to just help people. So yeah. that's what I love about the podcast. 100%. And I, I'm, I'm grateful personally for you bringing me on to do this because not only do I get access to you as a CEO of a fast growing company and I get an hour of your time every week to um, ask you questions, uh, but it's also, it's another gig for me where I, I get paid to do the thing that I love, which is doing podcasting. And you always talk about hiring when it hurts. I don't necessarily think that a podcast uh, is hiring when it hurts, but I feel like you're justifying it in a good way. And I believe in podcasting. So to see you invest in it makes me happy as well. Yeah. Uh, quick fire questions. What is your favorite podcast episode of this year on the podcast in JR? Mm, the mental health one. That was the best. Uh, that's my favorite as well. Probably not, probably not for everybody else, but it was, it was my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. Like I, I feel it was, helpful for people because a lot of people go through it without talking about it that's the thing with like men and going through mental health stuff is we just don't talk about it enough and yeah. when people listen to it on a podcast and they can relate to certain things and if it helps one person or a few people make some decisions that have also helped us then that's good for me so i personally really enjoyed that one i also loved the rob walling episode that yeah. every time I've spoken to Rob, he's just gone higher and higher my estimation because the way he approaches business and life is very impressive. And he's just like a font of wisdom that he's absorbed over the years. I also liked my like riffing back and forth with all the guests, like even Jason and, and Aaron. Yeah. And, you know, it's been, it's been good. Um, is there a niche that you sold a lot on, on Lemon Sweetie that has surprised you that that has been something that has sold a lot? I've got one that surprised me. Do you? I mean, obviously, like AI's, you know, that one's, it's not surprising, but it's sold a yeah, lot. I was gonna say. Um, hmm. There's been like a, like a, so it's kind of like a Discord. It's called autopod.fm and it's like automatic editing for podcasts. It is so popular, like so popular. 
I cannot. I, I know this it's, is. it's it's amazing. Like how much, how yeah, it's it's a really great product, and they do really well. And they sell through Lemon Squeezy. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I I have seen this promoted, and this is just for Premiere Pro. And I use Final Cut Pro, and also Descript for my editing. And Descript has a lot of these time saving features. If I use Premiere Pro, I would 100% use this. For me, the surprising niche was, and I don't know if surprising for other people, but it is the sheer size of the Notion template market. And oh, yeah, yeah. People seem yeah. to just keep making Notion templates and keep making a lot of money. We recorded with Thomas Frank, who is making over 100K a month, selling a lot of Notion templates. Watch out for Framer, though. Framer, Framer has yeah. blown up this year, and I'm, I, I think this year is going to be, be a big year for it. Do you have like a, a dream creator or business that you have seen on the internet that isn't on Lemon Squeezy that you would love to come over? If by some reason they're listening and you want to say, we'd love to have you on the platform, who would that be, JL? There's a lot, actually. I'd still love to to try and talk to the Tailwind guys, see if they yeah. would come over. That was, yeah. I really like Adam. I love, I actually, Jonathan, like their whole team, like Steven, it's like they're amazing. Like they're just yeah, and then what they've built, obviously. And there's some old icon, like Mac apps, like Icon Jar. Talk to the, the guys there. And, the, you know, I, honestly, there's a ton I could list off, but that's probably the, the one that comes to my mind. Uh, we, we, we're talking about a lot of the good stuff. You've sort of talked about things that um, might not have gone so well. But, uh, like, truthfully, have you fucked up at anything this year? Gosh, that's a good question. Yeah. I wish we could find a way to make the easy peasier more with like our fees. That bugs me. Mm -hmm. Like the way that we always, I, we fucked up. I feel like uh, that's a strong word. <laughs> I know, I know. But, I, I used but it for it's, the... uh, I think support, we fumbled more than I would have okay, liked yeah. to. That is one that I don't like because I love speaking to all the customers. I do support every day. I try to as much as I can. I love talking to the people. I don't mind dealing with the hard tickets where someone's frustrated or needs something or so yeah that would that would that would probably be the biggest thing and I would say it's not like a fuck up it's something I'm not sure if it was the right choice was earlier in the episode I said we were really focused on product led growth did I fuck up at all by not doing any marketing and sales more than we could have mm -hmm. that's that would be like another thought yeah, I, I, I use strong words, be provocative and see if there was something that really did stay out in your mind. But I think those are the things that you can tell if you've listened to previous episodes that have stood out. Did, did you like set any goals that you didn't hit? Like last year, I, I, we will finally get on to goal setting and how you approach it. But did, was there anything you set last year that you didn't achieve? Honestly, we had one goal, which was to 10 times the business and we did that. Boom. Perfect. There you go. Easy. Set bigger goals next time fucking 10 <laughs> times the business it's insane all right then 2024 coming up we've got a full year i love this yearly reset thing some say it's arbitrary i think it's super useful to have like a clear uh, right this is what we've done this year so yeah, yeah I, I i like this reset every year okay so yeah i i mean i'm with you on in terms of like goal setting and resetting the year i'll tell you the way that i do it and i'll tell you why I think this way is powerful is one. I think like even the yearly review I wrote for lemon squeezy, there's something about writing that forces you to, you know, just sit down, think through it and get yeah. your, get your thoughts out of your mind onto paper. I think that that's really powerful. And especially when it comes to like goal setting and there's a lot of opinions, like don't set goals, you set outcomes or you, you know, there's all these different things. So whatever <laughs> works for you, I don't really fucking care. But I do think the exercise of being intentional with your thoughts and what you want to do, whether that's called like manifestation or, you know, the manifesting idea, right? Like there has been years where I've missed my quote unquote process that I typically do. And I always do it. Mine is always on January 1st. Like even my wife knows she's like, she knows that I get up, I set my office for as long as I need. And I do it in three ways. I do family goals, personal okay. goals, and I do work goals. And I typically start with like the personal ones. And there's this girl named, I think her name is Mel Robbins. And I love that she has like a TED talk and I love the way that she described this, but she basically talks about how your brain doesn't actually know 
when things happen to you, if they were real or not, even if you imagined them, positive or negative. If you got in a car accident and your mind actually thought that versus it actually happened, she's saying that your brain doesn't actually know what really happened. Like you can trick yourself into thinking those things. And so I think what she's saying is, is you can train your brain to like have these different filters and thoughts, positive or negative. Mm-hmm. And your, your, your brain, if you visualize things like going to the gym or, you know, walking into this home that you want to live in or the car that you're driving, like there is something in there that encodes it into your brain to change the filter and the way that you think about it. I'm not trying to get too artsy fartsy or whatever, or, or too like, you know, visionary but i do think that there is there's something about reprogramming your brain to be that way and and change i guess the network of neurons that act as a filter for your brain and how you think and you know so i with all that being said i do sit down and think about like my personal self fitness financials you know things like that and but I take it a step further and, and I do try to think about what do I feel like in that moment? What yep. am I seeing or what's around me? Who's around me? And it's like I said, when I do actually do it, it's been pretty good. I will say that I have it. I have, <laughs> if you haven't noticed with the product of lemon squeezy where it's like a million fucking things in one, I have a tendency to push things pretty far where like I'll, I might overdo the goals or overdo what I think I can accomplish. But yep. that goes back to like a lot of times people, you know, overestimate what they can do in a year, but underestimate what they can do in 10 years. But yeah, to recap, it's like personal family and work is kind of how I do that. What were your personal goals last year? So I have, there's financial ones of like how much, uh, you know, my goal in terms of like making a month and investment yep. vehicles and, and sources of income you know, the way I organize my trust and my will. And like, those were like the things that were even like, I had a dumb one, which was like, I realized that I have a lot of accounts, passwords, and I wanted to centralize those for my wife. That was like more around the trust and the will stuff. Yeah. yeah. Just, just knowing that it sounds morbid almost, but it's stuff I want to think about. And so that was one. And then the other side is the health side, physical and mental. So just like fitness goals with body fat percentage, limiting alcohol. I don't mind drinking. I mean, I love whiskey. I love having a beer with friends, but I'm definitely like, I try to limit the amount and when I do it and because it mm. does, it does impact you, you know, whether you want to say it does or doesn't. And and also mm. for me, I'm not saying this for everyone, but I have, a, I'm pretty good at balancing things. I love ice cream, but I don't eat every day. But like I, <laughs> I do love sometimes having a couple beers in front of my computer and writing there's something that unlocks in my brain when i need to be creative so there's a lot of good things about it and then i would say the only other thing that i had was the mental side where trying as i'm building this company i am i can push myself and i really worked on utilizing headspace saunas like just trying to playing playing outside with golf and stuff like that you know so yeah i i respect how regimented you are with it and you can like look back at your last year and say look these are my goals for it my approach has changed where i used to be quite regimented with it and this year i found when i was doing my reflection again i really like spending that time doing it but i feel like every goal i set last year it was just it was too there was too many of them and half i hit half i didn't do i feel better about hitting them i don't know sometimes i yeah it, it was a bit scattergun then this year I thought I want to be happy and healthy and right now the things I'm doing are kind of working so more of the same I don't have any massive desire to grow much further but I do have a desire to be more focused about the work I'm doing and we had a chat about this just over slack a little while ago and it, it has made me think that i if I'm going to grow something I need to be more focused I can't have my attention split between things and I just need to get better at doing the work. It sounds like you have those things. And I think that that's important is like, it's, it's no different than, you know, watching a, you know, a kid or, you know, I don't know. I mean, even just I'm trying to think of an analogy, I don't have one, but you can aimlessly walk around and look up before you know it and realize how far you've traveled in the wrong direction. Right. So I think that's more the, that's more of the, the idea here. Right. It's not yeah. like I am Mr. Goal oriented and I have a hundred goals and I do this and that. And it's just more of dude, take a second and think about what the fuck you're doing so you don't 
You know what I mean? It's there's nothing wrong with that. I agree. So yeah, for for me this year, it's just about continuing what I'm doing in the physical health side of things. I'm really, really enjoying taking time to do my hobbies, to do my recreation. And I feel like that is positively impacting my work. Uh, when I do get my work and I get into the flow, I feel great. I've got the set work that I do. I was going to say one last thing on like, on the work side of my goals, I have a theme for the year. I've done this since 2017 or 18. So I actually have them written down here in front of me. So I have 2018 was the time is now. 2019 was block and tackle. So like that was a year of like getting basics. So I had resigned in 2018, right? The time is now. Yeah. Block and tackle in 2019 was getting everything kind of organized and doing all the basic stuff. 2020 was create, not consume. That's when we kind of got lemon squeezy built and ready. 2021 was chop wood, carry water. That was like, kind of like block and tackle. Like, Let's just stay consistent, right? And then 2022 was decades, not days. So that Mm -hmm. launched me into that long-term thinking. 2023 was moats and marketing. So we created a lot of moats for Lemon Squeezy last year with all the features and to kind of separate us. 2024 is TBD. I don't have it yet. So Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Also, you're such a marketer that you come up with themes for your goals for the year, and they're all like these pithy, fun catchphrases. That's actually so funny. Just... I didn't think about that, but I probably sound like such a <laughs> such a weirdo to people. They're no, like, "You are so weird." But you know what? I'm just trying to fly my freak flag this year, and so I'm just gonna do it. Hey, hey, that that's the theme. TBD, flying your flip freak flag. <laughs> oh. I love that, actually. Freak flag. All right. Write it down. Yeah, I mean, it's true because I, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Twitter. Getting myself out there. I'm flying that freak flag. Getting freaky with it. Cool. All right, so what are the goals for Lemon Squeezy this year? Because you've got the features that you've laid out, cart, upsells, bundles, marketplace, the big bad marketplace, PayPal, more WordPress courses, memberships, more email marketing, the V2 is the customer portal as well. So you've got those features, but what about the goals for growth, hiring? Have you sort of set those things? So I read a book. I haven't finished it. I thought I had it by me. It's called the growth handbook. It's about, it's scaling from 10 people to 10,000 people in a startup. Yep. It's a really good book, but it kind of, it talks about the role of the CEO and executive team. And so my mind's been there, but in terms of like, just to kind of like rapid fire things back to you, we have a specific goal for GMV. That's how we kind of operate the business. We're heavily thinking about monthly volume on the platform. And that's how we do our cohort analysis with merchants and things like that. So that is one. Number two is there is very specific features that we're trying to get out marketplace being one of those. We have a few others kind of in our sleeve that we're interested about to see how those go. I mentioned affiliate and V2 revamps and stuff like that. And then the team, where I kind of am thinking is how we structure the team and where we're placing our bets in terms of how much product-led growth continues or do we mar- do we bring out the sales-led growth or marketing-led growth into the, the recipe this year? And then do we do we... Does that also, do we segue outside, you know, Twitter stays and then now we bring in a new medium like YouTube or LinkedIn or something like that. So high level, you know, role the CEO, delegating, putting functions in place, go to market strategy, product led, does that expand? And then obviously the features are coming. So that's, and then we have this North Star of even this, we were having, before this call, I was on the phone with Liam and Orman and Gilbert and we were talking about the marketplace making product decisions. And it was, there was a lot of times where we would say, well, does this align with what the goal is this year? The North Star. Mm-hmm. Cool. Do, do you, uh, how, how do you make sure they're like achievable things that you want to get to? Do, do you put much on that or is it just number? Uh, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's not like that. Kind of using like, you know, some based on historicals from last year, kind of how we did and what we did. And then also... I mentioned this in the fundraising thing, but we had three, I guess, projections, which was a C C90, C60, C10. Do you remember this? No. Okay. So when I did my financial modeling for the Series A, I had three different confidence levels for the numbers we would hit. So there was a confidence level of 10%, C10. 
confidence level yeah. of 60%, which is C60, and then 90%, which is C, the C90. Wow. So if we think about that differently, C90 is like, that's me sitting with an accountant or my CFO or whoever it is and saying, we will hit this number, 90% chance we got this. 60% is more of a you know casino, roll the dice. We, you know, got a pretty good chance we're going to hit the number we want. And the 10% is like, we just hit a fucking home run and we just absolutely <laughs> obliterate all the numbers. It's maybe not as applicable because we're not like, you know, funded or anything. We're tr not trying to go after, you know, by all growth by all means, you know. So to answer your question, it's probably sitting more, you know, in that C60 kind of realm of we got a pretty good chance we're going to hit this. And if we do, there's a lot of things that are exciting. Like we, you know, we're talking about our profit sharing model and how we'll open that up with the, with the team and there's a lot of exciting things like that for the team too, you know, not just the customers and what the platform will become, but the company itself. Cool. Good stuff. Hey, what'd you think of that Matt episode, by the way? I haven't watched it yet, but what'd you think? Slow to start with, very slow to start with. And I was like, ah, it warmed up towards the middle when we were talking about newsletters. I think it was really useful hearing his approach to like the the brand advertising model not being as good because I'd, I'd not actually considered the cost per click model for newsletter yeah. and yeah, simply how he's saying going after niches i i quite like the end of how he's investing in sioux falls as well you no know, it's cool yeah you're right it is i guess i guess you probably you just edited it from the beginning huh and he was he was kind of like yeah and like it's basically i didn't ask a question till about 25 minutes into the episode i like how you ask them questions to guests because you're often coming from a completely different position of when you're asking the questions especially to people mm. like jason and rob like i can ask the fun or almost almost uneducated questions i've not been there i don't know what's going on but i'm like curious why is this the why do you think the way you do uh but you can go well we've been through this and so yeah you you, you come at questions from a different different place i'm excited to hear it and see what he sounds like and stuff but shit, man. I mean, he's built a newsletter of 25 million. I mean, he's a great guest to have on that people haven't never heard of. But and he was divulged all of his numbers. He had no problem. Yeah, I, and he literally had it on his screen. He's like, oh, let me just check our revenue from two years ago. Oh, yeah, it was 7 million. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You can literally just click and find that. He almost makes it sound simple. He's like, well, obviously, I know those numbers. And obviously, you choose the CPC model. Why would we hire more for it? I loved how candid he was at the end when we asked, like, how do people, like, go about investing in their community? He's like, make the money first, then invest. Yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, well, JR, this has been a fun episode discussing uh, everything that's gone on in 2023. It's, it's been really fun to watch your growth over the last year and best of luck for next year. I'm excited to sort of see what you've got in store. Okay, all right.